All right, it's good to see everybody out tonight. We'll, uh, what we've been doing the last couple of nights, we start out by singing Send a Great Revival, 723. 723, we'll sing that through a couple of times. Send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control. And send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control and send a great revival to my soul. One more time. Send a great revival to my soul. Send a great revival to my soul. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our final day of uh, revival, but maybe not. You know, it might keep spreading. That's what we pray and uh, see what God's going to do. It's good to see you here tonight, and we're going to have a great time, I know. And as I did the, the other two nights, I'm going to do it again tonight. If you turn in your hymnal to number 24, pretty close to the beginning, it's not a song, it's a scripture reading. So before I pray, I want us just to read this. This passage, number 24. All right, everybody got that? Here we go. I'll read the light print if you'd respond by reading the dark. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord strike in the mighty This is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are my God. And I will give you thanks. You are my God. And I will exalt you. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will praise God's name in song. And glorify him in the Amen. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this new, new day that you've given us and this time to come together to, to worship you. We, uh, we pray that your presence would be uh, evident in, in everything that takes place here. We pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work of conviction and encouraging and whatever it is. And I pray that you would help us to come with an open heart and uh, understand the need to have this uh, reminder of, of how much you love us and all you've done for us and therefore we can there are, there's nothing we cannot do to, to honor and glorify you and and, and uh, to extend your kingdom and so father i pray that you would guide this time be with the the songs we sing let them uh, touch our hearts and minds and souls and we pray for the testimonies that are shared and then for the word of god then uh, that we study together that you would just Bless Daniel, give him the words that, uh, that you want him to say, those things that you put on his heart, and help, help us to be receptive and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us through that process. So thank you, we, we worship you, we praise you, and we're looking forward to seeing what you're going to do in our lives. Whatever happens, help us take it out of this building and into the world to make a difference. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to be standing again, turn to page 539, 593, 593. Oh. 
empty Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is I know that He can do for you testimony and uh, that's a privilege to give my testimony and uh, I told you I said I'm just gonna read it um, I got it all typed out and so I'm Sandy some of you don't know me and that's my husband Neil okay. <laughs> And Daniel was my pastor. Yeah. He kept me in line. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I was born and raised in southeastern Ohio uh, in a working class family with two brothers and one sister. I wasn't raised in a religious home, but my mother took us to church every Sunday. And my father was a stay-at-home dad on Sunday mornings mainly because he was hung over from the night before. My grandmother was a believer who lived her life for the Lord every day, and I would spend as much time as I could with my grandmother, always remember, remembering her reading the Bible or listening to a preacher on the radio. The memories of my grandmother's church are ones I will always remember. The people love to sing praises to God well, I was a typical teenager growing up who enjoyed parties, school activities, boys, sports, and I loved playing in the high school band. I was even active in our youth group at church, serving as state youth representative for our denomination, but I wasn't saved. After I graduated from high school, I took a job at High University in the psychology department as secretary, living at home and commuting got old after a while, and I decided to move to Athens with a friend. I was only 18 years old, living on my own in a college town. This was not a good combination. Soon I was involved in the freedom of the world, the freedom the world had offered, and no one telling me what to do or not to do. I stopped going to church and basically put God on the shelf. Between 1969 and 1974, several of my best friends had become Christians. My friend from grade school was the first to become a Christian. She had gotten married and moved to Georgia, but she never forgot me and my need for a savior. She prayed for me and confronted me about my lifestyle many times. One thing I will never forget is a question she asked me. She said, Sandy, what type of husband do you want? I told her I wanted a man who believed in God and attended church. She said, well, if that is so important, why aren't you in church instead of the bars? And she was funny. She will never, she said, you will never find a husband with those qualifications there. That started me thinking. 
Then another friend had accepted Christ as her savior too. I noticed my friend's lives projected a peace that I didn't have, but I wanted it. Oh, how I longed for that peace. But I knew I wasn't good enough for Christ. I told myself I will have to clean my life up and then I will come to him. Man, I couldn't do it. I could not clean my life up. I just sunk deeper into sin and, and what was all the wrong things. I remember it was spring 1974 in the living room that I picked up my phone and I called Sally. I was desperate because my life was getting worse and I was, I was so empty inside. She answered the phone and I just blurted out, are you still praying for me? Because my life is worse than ever. She reassured me that her church was praying. In fact, they were in revival all week and they were specifically praying for me. Oh yes, I said, well, I don't think it's working because I'm worse than ever. She explained to me that God was indeed working in me. I just didn't understand it yet. She told me that again, that all I had to do was come to Jesus as I was, and he would forgive me of my sins. I, I couldn't, I wasn't good enough for him. So on I went without him. Several weeks later, I was returning from a long bike ride in the country when I decided to get off the main street and ride on the sidewalk. I was only two blocks from my apartment when all of a sudden a car came speeding out of an alley just in time to hit me. I saw the car and I knew it was going to hit me. I remember crying out to God to save me and he did. My body was thrown in midair. I was and I reacted as though I was doing a one and a half flip off a diving board. I believe God helped me to react this way to save my life. I put my arms up around my head and went into a tuck position. This caused me to roll off the car onto the pavement. The car didn't even stop and it drove away. There I laid in a daze. The next thing I remember is a woman bending down and asking me if I was okay. I told her I was okay, but my new 10 speed was a mess. She told me she was an emergency room nurse, and she took me to the hospital. I didn't really want to go, but she insisted. And after several x-rays, they dismissed me and said I was okay, but I would have a bad bruise on my hip. The next day, I got up and went to church, but I still hadn't surrendered my life to God. I would struggle for several months until I finally understood God's grace. It was the first week of July and I was taking my 16-year-old sister with me to Virginia Beach. We were going to go camping and hang out on the beach for a week and have a good time. I had slipped back into my old ways, forgetting the bike incident and God. Well, God hadn't forgotten me and my friends were still praying for me. God had something special planned for me and I didn't know it. My sister and I were in the ocean body surfing when all of a sudden something started to pull me out of the water. It was a force I never experienced and still haven't to this day experienced anything like it. I was drawn up to the boardwalk but didn't know why. My sister was yelling, where are you going? And I said, I'm not sure. There was a group of young college students putting on evangelistic drama. I stood there listening taking in every word they were saying. The story for the drama was from John 8, 1 through 11. It was about a woman caught in the act of adultery. I had never heard this story and the things they were saying started to make sense. Here were teachers of the law and Pharisees bringing this woman to Jesus who had committed adultery. She had been caught in the very act. They kept questioning Jesus about this woman and telling him that in the law, Moses commanded she should be stoned. But to my surprise, Jesus says to these upright men, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Everyone was leaving after that, after they had completed their drama, but I just stood there. A young lady asked if anyone wanted to know more about this forgiveness, 
and I just started to cry. Yes, I wanted to know. This college student by the name of Susan Sucris from the University of North Carolina came over to me and started sharing the gospel message. I didn't pray then, but she invited my sister and me to a Christian coffee house that night to hear a band. She also gave me a Good News for Modern Man book to read. I remember taking that book and reading it that afternoon. That night, my sister and I got ready to go to the coffee house, and we heard some young men share their story about their relationship with Christ. Finally, later that night, I walked out on the beach, fell to my knees, and asked God to forgive me of my sins and come into my life. I told him that this commitment was for life, and I would serve him until the day I die. That was so... Uh, I'm sorry, July 4th, 1974. And uh, I always say that fireworks went off when I got saved. <laughs> As my friend said, yeah, Sandy, it took us long enough to pray for you. And uh, I returned to Athens, and um, God, the Susan had, had prayed for me for a church. And um, she said, look for a church that had a mid midweek service. And I did. And the church that God led me to was right across from where I was hit with a car, that church. And uh, I never dreamed that I would be attending that church. And I walked into that worship service not knowing one person there, but I knew God has chosen it for me. And I quietly slipped in the back of the room and listened with my new ears. At the end of the service, the pastor asked if anyone had something to share. I could feel something making me stand up. And now I know it was the Holy Spirit proud of me. I stood up and very quietly told them what had happened to me. I said, I just got saved during my vacation and came back to Athens, and I don't know one Christian. Everyone started saying amen and coming around me. <laughs> and this was a new experience for me and uh, congratulated me into the family of God. And this. That's my story. That's my testimony. And uh, I praise the Lord for my friends that prayed for me. So don't ever give up. Keep praying. And uh, I just thank you. So Daniel, do you think you're going to preach? <laughs> That's pretty good stuff, there. But, uh, well, in a minute, I'll tell you a little bit about my history. We'll start out with a song. This is called, When He Was on the Cross, I Was on His Mind. mistakes and often slipped just kind of flesh and bone but I'll prove someday just what I say I'm of a special kind my dear brother Let's just start it over, Roy. Sorry, guys.
I'm not on an ego trip I'm not here on my own I've made mistakes and often slipped Just common flesh and bone But I'll prove someday just what I say I'm not a special kind When he was on the cross I was on his mind can be as elaborate as Sandy, but I guess if I go back, I was born in 1952 at Mary Rutan Hospital. I'm the middle child. I got two older brothers and two younger sisters, so I'm the middle guy. I, I hear that that's a special place to be sometimes. I don't know, but, uh, uh, but mom, she always did her best to try to have us kids in church. Dad never went to church as far as I can ever remember. He's never seen him step foot inside of a church, except for maybe a, a wedding or a, a, maybe go to a funeral home once in a while. That's about it. But, uh, but yeah, she, she did a good job trying to teach us right from wrong and taking us to church. She, and I've told the story before that the fact that I'm a druggie because mom drugged me to BBS and to Sunday school and church, you know, so, so I was a druggie. And, uh, but, uh, so if I was to look at some significant events that took place in, in my childhood, it had to, it'd have to be those events of going to Sunday school and VBS. And, and I, and I'll, I'll never forget one time we went to a, a, a concert for the Spears family. Some of you may know that name, but, uh, and that would have been when I was probably seven, eight years old. So they would have been maybe kind of fresh into the system at that time, I would have, maybe. But uh, it always, the, their music just touched me in a special way, even as a child. You know, I was like, man, this is awesome, you know. Uh, so I've always liked 
I always liked music and uh, and I always found myself singing along with the radio and, and whenever I'd be out with my brother, Dick, he and I'd be singing on the radio, he said, Would you shut up? They're singing it just fine. You know, it says they're doing they're doing a good enough job on their own. You don't need to help them. And uh, but uh, probably around 1961, uh, we were living outside of Lewistown, and uh, and Mount Tabor had a bus ministry going. Some of you know Reverend Bogart at that time, and uh, and so I was getting on the bus and going to church and. Uh, but then there was a, another aspect of that because my oldest brother was sweet on one of the girls, one of the Likens girls that was over there. So, uh, he, you know, I got to go because he was going. I got to go, you know. So, but anyway, but there was a there was an evening service over there, and and you know, at that age, you know, you're hearing things and you don't really quite know. I just say I didn't know what the spirit was doing to me, but at the end of the service when he was doing the altar call. I felt that the, I started crying, not knowing really why, but uh, I kind of covered it up and went on. But at that time, the same time in school, they were handing out the Gideon Bibles. And I had a Gideon Bible, and I remember telling mom, I said, I'm going to read this thing front to back. Well, I got as far as the begats and that was pretty much the end of reading the bible for me I, you know I, I didn't get much further than that in fact it wasn't until i came to church here that through pastor scott i went through the process i've actually read the bible cover to cover twice and uh I'm, and I, I for me that's a major accomplishment because i'm not a big reader period but uh, i thank the lord that i that I haven't been able to do that, and 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 Scott always he always come back and says, so now what? I said, you know, you read it clear cover to cover. Now what? I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know? But uh, always challenging, always challenging me. And uh, so uh, I've got my notes. So. Uh, So I floated around you know, in my teenage years and uh, never really got serious about serving the Lord. It wasn't until 1973 and I was married and I was working at Quincy Foundry and one of the foremans that worked there said, you need to come down to our church, we're having revival. Well, it happened to be Churches of Christ and Christian Union, Grace, uh, Quincy Chapel, and, and so, and which is kind of an uh, offspring of Grace, uh, this church. So. But, uh, and uh, so went to the altar, accepted Jesus as my Lord during that revival time. And uh, so over the next few years, uh, you know, I attended more revivals. We had camp meetings. We had church growth. I, I attended church growth conferences because of some of the areas of responsibilities that I, I got plugged into. And uh, so served in several different capacities at the church after that. And then uh, I, in 1994, I attended uh, uh, an Emmaus walk in Sydney. And I can tell you at that time, it wouldn't have taken much for me to just walk away from the church and God. I was just so discouraged and I said, this, this just ain't working. But I can tell you when I went on the Emmaus walk, it was like being saved all over again. I mean, it was, I can't really put into words uh, of how much it brought me back to where I needed to be with God. And uh, the, the Emmaus walk was amazing for me. Um, <clears throat> we, we did some studies with the pastor that was at the church at that time, and we talked about spiritual gifts. And I can tell you that was another thing that was a significant step in my walk with Jesus is identifying what gift has God given you to use for his glory. And um, ended up through this process, when we got to the end of it, my thought was I had the gift of helps, that I could help people. 
with what skills that I have. And, and I've done that for ever since then, or even prior to that, because I've always worked on cars. Some of you know that Dad bought a junkyard when I was 11 years old, and I lived in a junkyard until I was 18 plus. So I've always worked on cars, and uh, and I've worked on more pastors' cars than you than I can count, and uh, along with everybody else's. And uh, and I'm glad that I've been able to do that for the Lord. And uh, so uh, finding out the gifts of help, and and I think it's critical for anybody that is in a Christian walk to find out what is it that, what is your gift and then focus focus on that gift don't try to play the field and try to do them all pick the one that works you know and move on and uh, sometimes that's the case in 1997 I started attending promise keeper conferences some of you may or may not know the promise keepers and I had the privilege of going to Washington, D.C. Is it cutting out, Roy? Sound like it. Anyway, and for the Million Man Walk in Washington, D.C. And uh, I've got pictures in my office that I'm proud of, aerial pictures showing all those guys on, on the mall. And uh, that was an experience that you just, you, you had to be there. You know, in order to experience that number of people there wanting the, our nation to know that there's men standing up for Jesus Christ, you know. And so the promise keepers was a big thing for me also. So, so I've had the privilege of, of using another gift, I guess, that God has given me to sing. I love to sing. And... Uh, I've, I've led music in several churches. I went out and done specials in different churches and been able to share Jesus. And coming here to Grace Chapel and being a part of the Gospel River Band that Linda was a part of, I know that it's, it's kind of dwindled a little bit, but we're still trying to do stuff with it. That has been such a joy for me to go around and spread the gospel in the nursing homes. And, and we did a lot of other venues. We did county fairs. We've done different things. But uh, to be able to share Jesus, and we made some CDs. And my, my understanding of those CDs, I went, I've heard as far as Australia, over in Europe, different places. And to know that, that we have had an impact. This little church had an impact in other countries because of some CD that we recorded some music on. And so well, for, for what God has, how he's worked in my life and allowed me to, to serve him, and uh, I'm not done yet. Nope, I'm going to keep going. And, uh, you know, there's been, there's been some tough times, don't get me wrong. It's not been easy, and it's been a, a times that, you just wondered, how, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to get through that? But God brings us through, takes us to the other side, and he's, he continues. And I, I, I know that I repeat myself in a lot of times when I pray and so on, but I really believe it. He treats me better than I deserve. And I'll, I'll say that to my dying day. And, uh, but I thank the Lord for, for what he has done in my life, and I give him all the all the credit for everything I've done. So we're going to sing another song, a congregational. It's called All Because of God's Amazing Grace, page 354. Thank you. 
studying, there you go, the book of Acts here in the last couple months. And uh, what a great picture it is. And Peter and John going into the temple, seeing the man there, not even paying attention to him, just... And P Peter said something so amazing. Silver and gold I don't have, but here's what I have. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Didn't say in the name of Peter. Didn't say anything about him or John. He said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. God is still changing lives. And Daniel has been uh, challenging us. So Daniel, come on up and, and do some more. It has been a joy to be with you all these last few nights, and uh, as you well know, by now we've been working our way uh, through and around the little book of Haggai. So if you take your Bibles out and go ahead and turn there while we are uh, getting ready. It's quite amazing to consider uh, the magnitude of God's word and the impact his word has on his people. And it really has been the goal these last few nights together to be able to make some reflections, to, to think about, to consider really the nature of revival. And uh, we're really, as you well know, we're, we're just scratching the surface in our considerations about how God transforms his people. And that's really basically the, the definition that I've been using to, to work through this time together is that revival is, at the very least, God transforming his people. And so Thursday evening, we reflected on the diagnosis of our dilemma. We were thinking about what is it that keeps us from God transforming us? What is it that keeps us from revival? And we discovered through the book of Haggai that really the symptoms that we often have, like distress, like discouragement, like distraction, all of these reveal one central problem. And the problem is self-glory. The sin of self-glory, as we found here in the God's people, during the time of Haggai's preaching, and certainly in us today, the sin of self-glory is when we are seeking satisfaction outside of God. When we think something else can bring us peace, bring us contentment, bring us satisfaction other than God himself, even the good things that God provides, if we end up depending on those rather than God, that's a, that's a form of self-glory. Self-centeredness, self-preservation, uh, self-esteem, all the stuff in our lives often revolve around ourselves rather than God. And so last evening, we reflected on the solution to our problem. We talked about how God's word is sufficient. God's word brings life. God's word brings revival. God's word is enough to treat all of our symptoms. God's word equips us for life and godliness. And so since his word revives us, we should believe it. <laughs> we should value it. We should obey it. And so tonight, we are going to be digging deeper into this one little area of obedience. Obedience. In order to enjoy the good transformation that God does in the lives of his people. And in order to really enjoy revival, repentance is required. And so as we're thinking about the area of obedience, we're going to dig deeper into that, and the, the depth takes us to this matter of repentance. Repentance. And so we're going to understand what that is. We're going to discover from God's word how it applies to our hearts and our lives and how it might change us. So specifically, we are thinking upon tonight, uh, how is it that God's word 
would awaken us to the point that our hearts, the very essence of our being, is startled, stirred, changed, so that we turn from our self-glory and turn to God in obedience to Him for His glory. How does that happen? Well, I want to begin tonight by reading Haggai chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 12, where we see how this very Word of God had the uh, impact upon His people during this time. So Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. There is there a bubble, the son of Shiltil, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Can we say obeyed together? Obeyed. Now let me just step back for a moment. Okay, Just by way of quick reminder, God's people at this time had spent at 70 years in exile. Okay, By the decree of Cyrus, the king of Persia, he said they could go back home and rebuild their house of worship, God's house. And he actually sent them back with credentials and he sent them back with money to do so. So here's a pagan king sending God's people Yahweh's people, the, the God of all creation, his people, back to their home city to rebuild this house. Pretty amazing. But here they are coming off of that exile, and they started out well. They got the foundation of the place laid. But then all of a sudden comes discouragement and distress, and they stop building the temple. And 15 years go by. 15 years, and it's laying in, in just... Uh, nothing happening, okay? They're working on their own fields. They're working on their own houses, but there's nothing going on with God's palace, God's temple, God's uh, house. And so he sends the prophet Haggai to preach a message to his people. And the message comes, and we know specifically when it comes, it tells us there in verse 1 of Haggai, and he speaks and he says, consider your ways, you're doing this, Consider your ways. Think about what's happening. You need to go build the house so that God would be glorified, so that God would be, can take pleasure in it. That's, that's the message that comes to his people. Now listen, God's people don't have the reputa reputation for just quick obedience. As a matter of fact, they've often, if you read through the Bible, they've often need some startling to happen. Right? They need shaken out of their boots. But at this point, hearing this word, that's why I'm amazed. Listen to what happens. Verse 12, the voice, the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the, the messenger of the Lord, he spoke to the people with the Lord's message, and he said, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Let's pause and just thank God for his word. Can we do that? Father, we are thankful. Uh, your word truly is sufficient. Uh, we're thankful that we have the full revelation of what you have decreed to, to grant to us so that we might know you. Thank you that this word points us to your son, Jesus the Christ, who is everything that we are not. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you'll help us now to preach this word, to hear this word, and to obey this word. So let it be, God, for your glory. Amen. Amen. God's people responded to his word. And in this way, we see a right response. We see a positive response. They actually obeyed God. And so tonight we're going to be investigating 
how God goes about stirring his people to obedience. And it's not just a, a matter of so we can have some inclination of how God does this. It's not a matter of just, you know, oh, let's think about this together. But this is a matter of so we can understand that this is how God operates. And then how is he going to operate in our lives? It's so that we too might uh, turn from our sin and trust in God and, and in Christ and, and depend on him to do what he wants us to do. And so this is more than just a getting acquainted. We want to dig in so that we too might be transformed. I want you to know that transformation, revival, is more than just pulling up our bootstraps. Okay, this is not a message of just try harder. That's not the message. I hope to draw our attention to the reality that, that revival is, is more than just give all you got. And I also want you to understand that revival is more than just let go and let God. It's more than that. Revival is when God the Holy Spirit is using God's word to stir the depths of our being to transform us from the inside out. This is not about just putting on good appearances, church. This is about being forever changed. So, you might think of it this way. If I were to bring it uh, before you tonight, I could have brought a, a beautiful, nice chocolate cake. It was an angel food cake that my mom, she was visiting with us last night, some of you met her, she uh, came up to visit the grandkids and watch them play soccer today and all this. And so, of course, she brought cake. All right. And uh, I should have brought it. But guess what? It's gone. <laughs> it's gone already. So but if I set that cake before you, I, I might point out how masterfully uh, she icing that thing, how, how beautiful it is. You, you might see all the details and the ornate way that she created it and stacked it and how tall it is, how wide it is. You, you can see all the external dimensions of this cake. But what you cannot see is all the ingredients that went into making that cake, especially not the exception of the love that stirred it all together, you know? And so in a similar fashion, that's what, I want, that's what I'm appealing to here is this isn't a message about just putting icing on the outside. This is a message of thinking through the ingredients that make up the substance of who we are as God's people. And so there's two things. I'm sure there's more, but there's at least two things that I, I want you to notice here in this text tonight. Two ingredients that really brings about genuine, authentic, true repentance. Number one is God's promise. God's promise. You see in verse 13, it says, after the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, Haggai the messenger, he speaks to the people again. And here's the message from the Lord. I am with you. Don't miss that. It's emphatic. It's pointed. It's a promise that God is making to his people. I am with you. And so we step back and we say, well, in what way was God with them? Because he certainly was not with them in the way that he was with them when he dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the temple. The temple's not even there. The foundation's there, but God's not going to be dwelling in the cherubim and seraphim and, and above the Ark of the Covenant. He, he's not even as he was in Egypt with the, with the flame by night and the cloud by day. How is it that God's with them? He gives this promise. And so we think, what is God doing here? How is he dwelling with his people? Well, he is dwelling with them, number one, through his word. His word is being spoken directly to them. And notice the promise of his word. I am with you. He's also with them in the way that he's 
providing for them, and the way that he's protecting them, the way that he's encouraging them. Now keep, keep in mind, what he is calling them to do to get back to work, rebuild the temple, is going to bring upon them more distress. If they're going to persevere and endure and keep going and keep doing what God wants them to do, they're going to have some persecution. It's going to happen. And it did happen. Keep reading the book of Ezra. You'll find that. It happened. And so how was God with them? He was with them to protect them, to guard them, to guide them, to give them the skill they needed to accomplish the task. Folks, when we look at our world today, I, got, I have to admit that there's not a whole lot about what's going on that really makes sense to me. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it makes sense in the, in the order of what God is up to and how he's bringing things to pass, yes. But, but in the immediate sense and all the hoopla, and I just, what? You know, it's the kind of stuff that just makes you shake your head and wonder. And so we, like the remnant of people in Haggai's day, we're, we're going to face the temptations of distress and discouragement and distractions. I'm telling you, it is happening, and it will happen. However, when we belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ, we have this certain hope, this certain promise. God says, I am with you. And it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. You, can, you think about your day, even. How many of you went to a soccer game today? Right? Okay, about half of you, yeah. The cross country thing. How many of you watching the game, the Buckeyes game? Yeah, all that, right? Sure. How many of you, Neil, you said you had a meeting or something in Columbus today? Like, we've got things to do, right? There's activity of our lives. And we found out the thing about busyness or whatever. It's okay to be busy. We just can't be distracted in our busyness. So we're always carrying Jesus with us. We always have this attitude of honoring him and bringing him glory in whatever we do. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That's right. That's a good thing for Christians to do. But as we're going, listen, we're, our lives are full of stuff. And so inevitably we're going to be tempted to be distracted. But whatever we're doing, we go with this promise. God says, I am with you. So what is there you have to do that he can't handle? <laughs> what conversation are you getting ready to have that, that he, he can't intersect and be in and help you? You see? And so we lean in on his promise. And what that happens then is we're turning away from leaning in on our own sufficiencies, leaning in on our own understandings, and we're leaning on God. But it comes as a result of his promise. He is with us. Now I want you to think about this. We can trust God's promise that he's with us. Now think about how that was resonating with these folks in Haggai's day. As a matter of fact, he makes a couple of statements here about this shaking. I'm going to shake the nations and so forth. At the very end, I alluded to this Thursday night, but at the very end of Haggai chapter 2, he makes a messianic promise about the signet ring. And it's going to come through the lineage of Zerubbabel. And we found out that that's Jesus the Christ. And so think of this. He's making the promise to these people here. It's another 500 years. Another 500 years before Jesus comes to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. So a lot of times we're still navigating. It's like, yes, God, you're with me. But then we're still navigating in our own sense of time. You know, and, and so think about what is it that you're praying about right now? And you need to apply this truth like repentance. Turn away from, it's got to happen now. You see, that's how we operate. In our self-glory, it's immediate. And then all of a sudden, if it doesn't happen immediately, we well, God, where are you? What are you doing? I can't believe you didn't. Really? 
I didn't know he operated on our timetable. I didn't know he was too super concerned about what we think of time. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't even have any cognizant awareness of time if it wasn't for him creating us. He's God. So here we are, thinking about God's promise to be with us. So we, we trust that he's with us, but trust his timing. You know, or what are the things that you're praying about these days? That it's like, okay, God, thy will be done. Thy timing be done. <laughs> Can we pray that way? When we belong to God, we have the full assurance that he is with us. We can trust the promise of his presence. One of the big reasons why this is the case is we understand that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. The very thing that he was calling his people to build at this moment was so that he might dwell with them, that he might take pleasure in it. But a part of his glory and pleasure is not just in what this temple represents, but is what is coming through the, the, the testimony of this temple, which is ultimately Jesus the Christ, who came and, and actually walked through the temple and drove out the temple and said, I'm the temple. Jesus said that I'm the temple. And you bury me and I'll rise it up in three days. And man, all kinds of people were ticked off about that. What are you talking about? It took us this long to build this thing. And we know today that for those who are born again by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. We, the church, those who belong to Christ are the temple. It doesn't get any closer than that. How much presence of God do you want? <laughs> That's internal. And that's what I mean by this revival that has to do with the, the depths of our being. It's rooted in the promise of God and one specific promise, I am with you. Is he with you tonight? If you're a Christian, he's living in you. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? Are you living in that reality? So... What is it that brings about this repentance of obedience? Well, we know it's God's promises, but also I want you to notice God's stirring. God's stirring. Verse 14, it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and, and the spirit of Joshua and the whole remnant of the people. Uh, this stirring of their spirit simply means that God awakened the spiritual breath of his people. Uh, and maybe you've seen uh, a person who is having a hard time breathing, and so they take their, um, what are those little inhaler, right? They take an inhaler, <gasps> and they take that and it helps them breathe, right? It's as if God is giving them a spiritual inhaler so that they can breathe spiritually. That's what it means that he stirred them. He, he blew back into them. He breathed back into them life, uh, spiritual mindedness. He changed their frame of mind. He changed their heart attitude. He changed them from the inside out, which is key. This is huge for genuine repentance. I'm thinking about the conversations that Jesus had with many of the, the lead, uh, leaders, religious leaders of his day, calling them whitewashed walls and, and things like that. You know, those, those guys, they knew how to pray. They had the garb. I mean, they, they knew the look. They could, they could put the icing on the cake. But they were empty inside, spiritually empty. And that's what God has always been about, the heart of his people. Loving him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, how is that possible? Well, here we see God stirring their spirit. This is, this is helpful to us because it gives us a good caution when we start having conversations about revival and repentance and, and things like that. It's the caution of seeking the outward effects of 
revivalism rather than the inward effects of God's stirring. You see, revival, true repentant revival is a supernatural work. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be naturally organized. This isn't something that's accomplished by natural means. It is God stirring. God speaks and his people repent. I want you to notice something here. There is a timing element repeated throughout the whole book of Haggai. That's why we can place Haggai so directly within the, the historical context of, of God's people because it says things like in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. And, it, and that's just, it keeps saying that all throughout. Well, well why is that? Well, there's this detail of what God is doing at, at specific moments in time. And so these details help us to see when you trace this out, God accomplishes. Listen, I haven't really thought about this. Fifteen years had gone by, and the foundation was just laying there. I suppose that during those 15 years, and listen, this is hypothetical, my own thing, but I suppose the 15 years, there's probably people walking by saying, oh, you know what, we ought to get back to work on that thing. I'm supposed there were probably three or four that would say, you know what, we really, we need to put together a committee to get that thing back on, you know. And, and I suppose there were probably a few who were just like, let's just get after it, let's go, I'm going to go for it tonight, I'm going to, you know, let's go fight off those guys who are telling us we can't do it. I suppose there were probably some conversations like that. But nothing happened. Fifteen years go by. But from the time that God's word comes to his people through the prophet Haggai to the time they pick up bricks and start building, 24 days. Here's the point. God can accomplish more in 24 days with his word and bringing about repentance from the inside out than we can with years and years and years of our own strength and our own power and our own flesh. You see, sometimes the grind of Christianity, the endurance, the perseverance that we do, knowing the right things that we're supposed to be doing and just keep doing them, I think revival often is when God breathes back into his people that spiritual breath of life to say, do this for my glory. We see two key ingredients here for repentance. Now, let's notice the fruit of repentance. God stirs his people. God promises his people. Now, uh, what's the fruit? If I go out and plant some corn, I want to know if I'm going to get corn out of it, right? God stirs and God speaks and, and God promises. So what's, what's happening here? I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 12, it says, All the people, the people, feared the Lord. You see that at the very end of verse 12? Now, it's interesting to me because this starts with uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil. And it's also Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. And so you've got the civic leader of the people and you've got the, the spiritual leader of the people. You've got the mayor of the city and you've got the pastor of the city. And God brings his message there through the leadership to all the remnant of the people. But notice all of them turn. All of them repent. This is an example of corporate repentance. Of collective repentance. And yes, it starts with the leaders, but it's all of the people. Now, that does not diminish, hear me out, this doesn't diminish the necessity of individual repentance. Okay, so like if you're in a herd, a herd mentality or, a, you know, a herd of cattle, uh, and everybody's turning and you get caught up in it and you're like, oh, well, I'll turn too, and you go with them, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a true believer, true Christian or anything to that effect. You might just be following the herd. 
So there, there needs to be this personal awakening, personal birth, a personal repentance that takes place. But this is also an example for us of corporate repentance. When the whole of the people turn. I don't know that we talk about that much. I think we should. We should talk about how God changes the lives of all of his people. A lot of times we really focus on the individual, and I think that's a lot of this self-centered stuff, self-centered religious stuff. It's all about you and what Jesus can do for you lately. And yes, but he acts on behalf of his people, all of us. Where's the awakening and the stirring of all of us? You're stirred, great, maybe that'll bleed on on everybody, you know, overflow, wonderful. But here we see all of these people fearing the Lord. Yeah, there's a, there's a great place for us to start church. Fear of the Lord. What does that mean? We hide in the corner and you know, shake because we're scared of him? Maybe. But I think it has a lot to do with we're more concerned about pleasing him honoring him, reverence to him than to ourselves. And so these people feared the Lord. This is one of the ways that we see uh, the effect, the, the fruit of their repentance. It, it brings to mind 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. If you want to turn there, you can. But I'm, I'm thinking about what does this mean? What does this look like in the church? And, and I think what we have in Corinthians is an example of God bringing revival, bringing repentance in his people, even after Pentecost, after uh, the, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in his people. You see, during Haggai's time, the temple is a building, it's a structure, and God manifests his glory there in a unique way. But today, in, in post-Pentecost, he, he manifests his glory. The Holy Spirit is in his church, in his people. Okay, so I'm looking for an example of where is this corporate repentance? And, and I think uh, the church at Corinth is an example of this. You, you remember, God is sending a message to the church at Corinth through the Apostle Paul. So we have this inspired book of Scripture, First and Second Corinthians. And it's a lot of correction, right? If you've ever read through those books, it's a lot of correction. And it does seem like they responded in repentance to this word of the Lord. It seems like they feared the Lord. And, and there's a verse here, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And I'd encourage you to go home and read around this, but I want you to notice. He says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. When God's word comes to God's people and there's change that needs to be made and, and transformation that needs to take place, it brings about a grieving that's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that is a good thing. It's godly grief. Why? Because it produces a repentance, change of mind and heart that results in a change of actions and behavior. You see, that's godly grief. It leads to salvation without regret. However, there's another form of grief. And this is where I think a lot of times we have fallen over the edge of, uh, of kind of a worldly grief. How many revivals does the pastor, man, I hope I haven't done this, but they just rail on you and it's like a guilt trip revival. You know, just get busy. You're not winning enough souls for Jesus. Get out there and get her done. I'm being facetious, I know. But that's the kind of stuff that doesn't last. But that's a lot of the kind of stuff that we put icing on ourselves and we think, man, I'm great. I'm a really good Christian now. I've, I've read my Bible every day for a week. 
great. Is your heart changed? You see, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief? The worldly grief is the kind of thing, it's like, oh man, I really feel bad about that, but it just it never produces any change. I, I, I had a lot of that growing up, right? I was really sad that I was caught, but it didn't change anything. I was just sad I was caught. That produces death. These folks, they started obeying the voice of their God. Essentially, the people turned away from their sin, the sin of seeking their own glory. And they devoted themselves to the glory of God. Not only did they fear the Lord, but lastly this evening, it says that they worked. Look at verse 14. It says the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And at the very last sentence, and they came and worked. Can you say work? I think it would be wonderful for somebody to write out, and I'm sure they probably have, and I don't know where it's at, but somebody to write out what the Bible teaches about work, a good theology of work. And here's one place. They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. I've already alluded to this, but there's nothing the matter with being busy about the Lord's business. There's nothing the matter with working and working hard. As a matter of fact, I think that's rooted in the very essence of our, our created stature in his image. He, he created us to rule over the earth. He created us to work. And we made a mess of it in our sin and our self-glory, right? And so we sweat and thorns and the whole thing. But there's something good and right in honoring and glorifying a God, especially for Christians who are born again by the Spirit of God, to work, to get after it, and go hard for the glory of God. These folks did that. Now the problem becomes, and this, is, this has always been a problem in the church, it will always be a reoccurring theme that comes against the church, is, is miscalculating the, uh, the nature of our work. Listen, uh, the, you read Paul in, in the book of Romans and you read James and, and they are actually complementing one another. Some people think they're contradicting, but they're not. Basically what they're doing is we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We are made in a right relationship with God by faith in Christ. That's it. Okay? That's how we can be reconciled to God. And then our work, just like in these folks, it's an evidence of our right relationship with God. So when we do things, when we use our spiritual gifts to serve God and, and all the rest, we are doing that as, an, as a sign, as a signal, as an evidence of we belong to God now. Okay, Our works do not save us. They, they don't make us right with God. It, it's like this. You can have works. You can have the icing on the cake and not be in a right relationship with God. But what you cannot have is a right relationship with God and no icing on the cake. God does, that, that's not the way it is. And so these people worked. They worked. One of the, the fruits of their repentance is that they got back to work. I don't know. I think we scroll a lot on our Facebook when maybe we ought to be doing some other things. I have a tendency toward that. Getting lazy. Getting lazy. Christians, if we are going to be repentant Christians, if we're going to be the Christians who are responding to the stirring of God and His Word and repenting, having our hearts truly stirred, then it's going to, it must have an effect on what we're doing, our behaviors. It must. And so we know. We know that God's Word is sufficient to transform His people. Amen? Yes. Yes. 
He stirs us. He stirs us to the very core of our being by revealing the roots of our problem. He's not interested in just putting a Band-Aid on a mortal wound. He's going to get to the nitty-gritty of the problem. And he does so. He opens us up, lays us bare, so that he might strengthen us and raise us up. And he does so by giving us hope. He gives us hope by speaking his promises, speaking his word. He he empowers us by his presence. I am with you, and may it be said of you, Grace Chapel and other folks from other churches, may it be said of myself, may it be said of us, may it be said of his church across uh, all glaze, Logan County, Ohio, United States, the world. May it be said of his church, as the Apostle Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, we give thanks to God always for you. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray for that. Father, in agreement with your word, we ask that that would be true of us. That we would be your people who work in faith we labor in love and lord that we would be steadfast that we would endure with hope in our lord jesus christ pray that would be true of each of us all of us your church for the praise of your glory in jesus name amen